The election of 1876 was one of a kind in American history. It ended in the oddest way and with the most controversial and unpopular outcome of any of our 59 presidential elections. The broad outline of the story is well known and it goes like this. The contest pitted Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes against Democrat candidate Samuel J. Tilden. It occurred after more than a decade of the Republican Party trying to ensure civil rights for African Americans in the South during the era of post-Civil War Reconstruction. It was only the second presidential election in which blacks were allowed to participate under the 15th Amendment. Not surprisingly, the black vote became the main point of contention. Blacks voted overwhelmingly Republican and they controlled the destiny of several southern states. Southern Democrats resented that. They were determined to stop it by any means necessary, and they engaged in intimidation of blacks, and in some cases, bloody attacks to prevent them from voting. Republicans protested loudly and begged for federal troops to be sent in to put a stop to it all. On and ele after election day, they accused the Democrats of all sorts of voter fraud and election rigging. Once the votes were counted, both sides claimed victory in South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. There was also a single unrelated vote in dispute in Oregon. Tilden held 184 electoral votes, and Hayes held 165. 185 was needed to win. The Electoral College could not determine the winner, nor could the U.S. House of Representatives. That put the nation in a constitutional crisis. So the two parties finally decided to solve the problem by creating a special commission to adjudicate the contested votes. The commission ultimately gave all 20 votes to Hayes, but the Democrats did not accept this decision until Republicans secretly agreed to cut them a deal. The deal was that the Democrats would accept Hayes as president in exchange for Hayes and the Republicans agreeing to end Reconstruction, along with giving them a few other things they wanted. This deal came to be known as the Compromise of 1877. It did what it was supposed to do. It settled the election and got the government and the country as a whole back to business as usual. But it also put African Americans into second class citizenship for the next 80 years. And that is mainly what it is remembered for today, the negative effects it had on the black population. So that's the short version of the story. It's accurate, but it leaves a lot of unanswered questions. How did this constitutional crisis happen? Why did the two parties decide to solve it the way they did? Have there been any long-term consequences of the compromise besides its effect on African Americans? And can we learn anything from it that is relevant to us in 2021? To begin answering these questions, we have to know the backstory. That starts with Reconstruction. Looking back on it, we think of Reconstruction as an era of U.S. history which the history gods have neatly packaged for us with bookend dates of 1865 to 1877. But people who lived through Reconstruction saw it not as a clearly defined era, but as an ongoing process. Depending on which part of the country you lived in at the time, the North or the South, it might have had little impact on your daily life, or it might have been just as bad or even worse than the war itself. Most Northerners went about life practically untouched by it and largely oblivious to it.
It's something they read about in the papers that was happening way down south. By contrast, most Southerners were touched by it daily, and in some cases very dramatically so. To white Southerners, it was an unwelcomed and intrusive experience, something that was being forced on them by aggressive, self-righteous, crusading Northerners, hell-bent on making the South in the image of the North. To black Southerners, it was an exciting but difficult, complicated, and sometimes perilous experience. Almost every year leading up to the fateful election of 1876 had seen some new twist introduced into the drama of Reconstruction. 1865 saw the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau, the assassination of Lincoln, and attempts by President Johnson to restore order in the post-war South through temporary governments. It also saw the establishment of black codes to replace slave codes the passage of the 13th Amendment, and the start of a lot of bad blood between President Johnson and the Republican-led Congress. 1866 gave rise to the Ku Klux Klan, the passage of the first major Civil Rights Act, and the start of the process to get the 14th Amendment passed. 1867 then saw Congress force a new military occupation of the South, in another attempt to restore order there. And in 1868, we saw Congress impeach President Johnson and pass the 14th Amendment, as well as get Northern war hero Ulysses S. Grant elected president. Grant's presidency started off in 1869 with supporting the passage of the 15th Amendment and starting the process of shutting down the Ku Klux Klan. By 1871, both had been accomplished. That seemed to put an end to the need for continued national focus on the regional issues of Reconstruction. The news media's attention thus began to shift more towards economic, social, and political issues involving industrialization and urbanization in the Northeast and Midwest, as well as taming the frontier of the Wild West and finally corralling the few remaining free Indian tribes onto government-run reservations. This shift in attention ushered in the Gilded Age in popular perception, even though Reconstruction was still going on in the South. These two eras of history then ran on parallel tracks, concurrent with one another for several years, before finally converging, or you might say colliding, in the election of 1876. Interestingly, the label Gilded Age comes from a novel written by Missouri boy Mark Twain in 1873. The book satirized the political corruption and shallow materialism of the day, creating a stereotype of American society which in reality applied only to a small segment of the population. But it accurately described the years of Grant's presidency, which saw more political scandals by far than any other time in American history before that. In his first term, for example, the infamous Black Friday gold scandal and the Credit Mobilier Railroad scandal rocked the country. Despite the bad stuff on his presidential resume, Grant managed to get reelected in 1872. But his victory resulted more from the weakness of the opposition than it did from his record. The opposition was New York newspaper editor <clears throat> Horace Greeley and his running mate, the governor of Missouri, Benjamin G. Brown. They waged a poorly orchestrated campaign on a fusion ticket of Democrats and anti-Grant liberal Republicans, also known as half-breeds. Grant's supporters, who got the nickname Stalwarts, ran a strong campaign mainly centered around staying the course on Reconstruction. Grant benefited from the black vote in the southern states, but he easily had enough electors to win without their help. Little did anybody know at the time this would be the first and last time black voters would get a chance to vote for president fairly and without interference for nearly a hundred years. That's because what came next was the so-called redemption, 
That was the name given to the revolutionary takeover of southern state governments by Democrats from 1874 to 1876. It ironically happened after Grant and Congress had passed three enforcement acts to prevent that very kind of thing from happening. Obviously, these laws were ineffective. So Grant and the Republican-controlled Congress then passed yet another big Civil Rights Act in 1875 to try to stem the tide. It likewise proved ineffective. The redemption had helped get enough Democrats elected to Congress that they took control of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1875. Meanwhile, other headline news stories dropped like bombs in Grant's second term. At the beginning of 1873, for example, the so-called salary grab by the Republican Congress dropped. These politicians voted themselves not only a pay raise, but back pay as well. And what was so galling about this to the public was that while the story was still in the news, the national economy tanked, sending the U.S. into the worst depression in its history up to that time. It lasted the whole four years of Grant's second term. Then, over the last couple of years of that term, two more big political corruption scandals broke in the news. The Whiskey Ring and the Indian Ring. Each increased the public's perception that the Republican Party was mismanaging the U.S. government. And all of this would be low-hanging fruit for the Democrats in 1876. By 1876, the Democrat Party was a half century old, while the Republican Party was merely two decades old. Despite the age difference, the younger had been by far the stronger of the two in recent years, thanks to its being aligned with Lincoln, the abolition of slavery, and the victorious Union side in the war. The Democrats, by contrast, suffered from the stigma of being more aligned with the South, slavery, secession, and in some people's opinion, treason. In popular perception, the Republicans were the party of federal power, wasteful spending, and civil rights, while the Democrats were the party that mainly existed to stop, slow down, or limit all of that. Cluttering the political scene in 1876 was an assortment of small third parties, none of which amounted to a big threat to the big two. The Greenback Party, the Prohibition Party, and the American National Party would end up sharing about 1% of the popular vote while garnering no electoral votes. As campaign season began ramping up in 1876, two events which still loom large in U.S. history today, one good and one bad, captured the nation's attention. The good was the nation's centennial celebration held in Philadelphia, which lasted from May to November. On paper, this extravaganza should have benefited the party that billed itself as the more patriotic Union loyalists of the two, the GOP. Ironically, it seems not to have mattered because neither party mentioned it in their platforms. The bad was the Battle of the Little Bighorn in Montana, in which General Custer made his infamous last stand. It was the most tragic defeat of the U.S. Army by American Indians ever. It reminded voters that as a nation, we not only had a Southern racial problem, but a Western one as well. Yet, neither of the two big parties had a good track record of dealing with Indian issues, so it is not surprising that neither campaigned on that. The timing of this tragedy was politically convenient for both parties because it occurred after their conventions, so they really didn't have to address it. So both parties chose to emphasize the issues that were their bread and butter. In their platforms, at their conventions, and in their campaigns, the Democrats chose fixing the problems of scandal and corruption resulting from the Grant administration as the main plank in their platform. The Republicans chose the continuation of the black civil rights agenda in the South.
The problem for the GOP was, at that time, a majority of white Northerners, Democrats and Republicans alike, were tired of dealing with the Southern racial problem. They were ready to let Southerners handle that themselves. They wanted to focus instead on fixing the bad economy and on reforming corrupt political and financial institutions. In other words, a majority of Republican voters seemed to agree with the Democrats on what should be the main issue. So Republican leaders were out of touch with a large segment of their base. To us today, it may seem somewhat ironic that the majority of voters in 1876 were motivated more by the need for reform than by the need to ensure civil rights for blacks in the South. Because we now know that the outcome of the election ultimately hinged on the unresolved civil rights issue, not on the reform issue. Yet, this helps explain how Tilden could win the popular vote by such a wide margin but still lose the election. The voters wanted one thing while the Republican Party was determined to give the nation something else. When we look back on Grant's presidency from our vantage point in 2021, it looks like the bad outweighs the good fairly substantially. It seems amazing, therefore, that he was still popular with voters in 1876, but he was and his stalwart supporters enthusiastically urged him to run for a third term. The fact that he said no is the main thing that gave Democrats a serious chance to win for the first time since before the war. Had Grant chosen to run, we would likely be studying a completely different history lesson right now. The Democrats' presidential nominee in 1876, Samuel Jones Tilden, is a somewhat tragic figure because he was one of the good guys in history who coulda, woulda, and shoulda been commander in chief, but never was. He got as close as any losing candidate ever got though. In the end, he lost this most controversial election by just one vote. And that one vote was awarded by a partisan commission rather than cast under normal procedures. Tilden was born in upstate New York, not far from Albany. He went to college first in Connecticut and then in New York City. He then settled down in the Big Apple to practice law and get involved in state politics. He became what was called a barn burner, meaning an anti-slavery Democrat. He supported Martin Van Buren's unsuccessful bid for a second term as president in 1848. He had a relatively uneventful decade of the 1850s, but when the Civil War broke out in 1861, he supported the Union. That put him at odds with the majority of his party during the war, but it proved to be his ticket to state and national prominence once Reconstruction started. He became the manager of Horatio Seymour's unsuccessful presidential campaign in 1868. He then got elected governor of New York in 1874 on a promise to clean up municipal and state corruption. New York epitomized the Gilded Age in the early 1870s. Tammany Hall, under boss William Tweed's control, had set a bad new standard for scandal and corruption. Tilden helped expose it and break the power of both Tammany and Tweed. This launched him to the top of the Democrat Party in time to get the presidential nomination in 1876. The Democrat National Convention that year was held on 3rd Street in downtown St. Louis at the newly opened Merchants Exchange Building. It stood basically where the current Hyatt Regency Hotel is, directly across from the Arch. At that time, it was one of the most attractive large event venues in America. Today, unfortunately, neither the exchange nor the building that housed it exists. At the convention, Tilden was chosen on the first ballot, as was his running mate, the governor of Indiana, Thomas A. Hendricks, even though Hendricks chose not to make the trip to St. Louis. The party's strategy for victory was to try to carry New York, Indiana, and the so-called Solid South. It almost worked, or maybe it did work but the election was stolen from them. Many people at the time certainly thought that 
and we'll never know for sure. Compared to Tilden, the Republican nominee, Rutherford Burchard Hayes, has a more common and less interesting background story. Rudd, as friends and family called him, was born in Ohio, just a few miles north of Columbus in 1820. He spent most of his life in Ohio, although he got part of his education in Connecticut and Massachusetts. As an adult, he settled down in Cincinnati, practiced law, entered politics as a Whig, and then helped launch the new Republican Party in 1855. When the Civil War broke out, he was commissioned a major, got wounded in battle, and was soon promoted to general. He saw action in both Virginia and West Virginia. In 1864, while still serving in the Army, he got elected to Congress. He was a moderate Republican from the start. He shunned the radical wing of his party because his feelings about slavery were comparatively mild and his opposition restrained. Not surprisingly then, after the war, first as congressman, then as a three-term governor of Ohio, his opinions on reconstruction policies were equally middle of the road. He supported civil rights for black southerners, but unlike some of his colleagues, it was not the only issue he cared about, nor did he feel the need to be outspoken about it. In 1872, he sided with the liberal half-breed faction over the stalwart faction of his party. This showed that he cared more about restoring good, clean, efficient, and cost-effective government than he did racial issues. Even so, he held Grant in high regard personally and supported his administration through both terms. Hayes won the presidential nomination of the Grand Old Party in 1876 by being what is typically called a compromise candidate. The front runner, James G. Blaine from the state of Maine, had made political enemies within the party. So had the second runner, Roscoe Conkling of New York. Thus, the door was open for an afterthought candidate like Hayes to sneak in. Conveniently, the Republican National Convention was held in Hayes' hometown of Cincinnati that year. The way party conventions were conducted in those days, nominees would be put forth and votes would be taken until there was either something approaching a consensus or at least a clear majority. Often these compromise candidates would end up winning because too many delegates could not stomach one of the big name candidates. Hayes won on the seventh ballot. The man chosen to be his vice presidential running mate, William A. Wheeler of New York, was an even more obscure public figure than Hayes. Not only had Hayes never met him before the convention, but he had never even heard of him prior to 1876. Even so, Wheeler won on the first ballot, thanks to his reputation of being one of the few squeaky clean Republicans that could be found at that time in the key battleground state of New York with its 35 electoral votes. Hayes let it be known early on that he had no intention of being a two-term president that seemed both noble and practical under the circumstances. His positions on the hot button issues of the day, along with his quiet gentlemanly composure, made him seem like a rather uninspiring and dull candidate. Yet it can be argued that is precisely what the country needed at the time. Certainly about half of the voters felt that way and the other half took comfort in knowing that if he won, they would have to suffer through only four years of a Hayes administration instead of potentially eight. His lackluster personality and conservative views made him appear weak to many observers at the time, and historians have typically perpetuated that perception. It may not be accurate though, as evidenced by his use of deadly force to break up the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 and by his courageously unpopular veto of the Bland-Allison Act. That strike, by the way, affected St. Louis, along with several other cities, 
while the Bland-Allison Act was co-sponsored by Missourian Richard P. Silver Dick Bland. Voting in general presidential elections <clears throat> was done somewhat differently in the late 1800s than it is today. Although the Electoral College ultimately cast the votes that determined the winner and loser, same as today, the popular vote was taken in a variety of ways, some of which are no longer in use. Some states used paper ballots cast publicly. Some used voice voting done publicly. And some used paper ballots cast privately. Some even used picture ballots for the benefit of illiterate voters instead of printed ballots. Occasionally, a state would not even hold a popular vote, but would let its legislator, legislature pick the electors. That happened in the brand new state of Colorado in 1876. If a dispute about who won a given state's popular vote arose, the U.S. House of Representatives, rather than the governor or some other state official or agency, determined the winner. There were all kinds of voter fraud and election rigging at this time, particularly in the cities run by political machines. But calls for reform at the national level were mostly ignored because both parties were guilty of the same crimes. It was therefore basically just written off as something to be expected, an unavoidable byproduct of democracy. The problems with the voting in the 1876 election did not center around that type of fraud, however, but rather primarily the type brought on by Democrat opposition to the black vote in the South. The so-called redemption had already been carried out in most of the southern states by 1876, and Democrat victory was thus all but guaranteed in them. But three states, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, had not yet been redeemed. Federal troops still occupied all three. Those troops were still propping up so-called carpetbagger governments, and they continued to do so even through and beyond the election on November 7th. In the end, it didn't matter. The redeemers were determined to take those states one way or the other, even if it meant restarting the Civil War. So election day came and went. Over a matter of weeks in November, the votes were counted. By December, the popular vote totals as best as could be tabulated were approximately 4,036,000 for Hayes and 4,300,000 for Tilden. So Tilden came away with an advantage of over a quarter million votes. The actual vote totals could not be proven back then, of course, nor can they be proven today, despite all our modern technology and information. If indeed, as the GOP alleged, thousands of Republican votes were either destroyed, discounted, miscounted, or altogether prevented in the first place in the South, who knows what the actual count would have been if there had been a fair election. As it was, however, approximately 51% of the vote was in the Democrat column to only about 48% in the Republican column. The missing 1% was divided among the various third parties of the day. One thing we do know for sure, this election saw the highest voter turnout in any election in U.S. history. Approximately 82% of registered voters cast a ballot. Based on the count as it stood going into the December Electoral College meetings, the only thing not in dispute was that Hayes held 165 uncontested electoral votes, while Tilden held 184. Interestingly, nearly half of these Democrat electoral votes came from southern states, yet the Republicans didn't contest them, even though they could have. Why didn't they? because there would have been no way to prove fraud in those states on the scale necessary to overturn the results. So disputing their returns would not have accomplished anything. It would have probably just exacerbated an already tense situation. <clears throat> 
Even so, the fact that the Republicans didn't dispute them arguably shows just how much their passion for racial justice had waned during the later years of Reconstruction. It turned out, of course, that they didn't need to contest the results of every Southern state. They just had to run the table and win the three where federal troops were stationed, where there was more and better evidence of fraud enough to win a court case or a congressional case with. Then they just had to get that one aberrant vote from Oregon thrown out. That Oregon vote dispute was the easiest of the bunch to settle. Oregon had three electoral votes. Two went clearly to Hayes, but one went to Tilden. But it only went to Tilden because the Democrat governor of the state refused to accept a Republican former postmaster as an elector. That postmaster, John Watts, had held his position at the time of the election, but had resigned it before the Electoral College met in December. Had this former government employee been a current one, his ineligibility would have been unquestionable because it would have violated the U.S. Constitution. But the Democrat case against him was flimsy ground to stand on in adjudicating the outcome of this election, and it ultimately failed. The Southern state votes were not so easily resolved. A different type of complication existed in each one, but they all had certain things in common. One, they all had carpetbagger governors supported by President Grant. Two, they all had redeemers who threatened and in some cases physically attacked Republican voters. Three, they all had Republicans in charge of the vote counting, or at least supposedly so. Four, they all had Democrats claiming victory and refusing to concede defeat. And five, therefore, they all ended up sending two separate and conflicting electors to the state's electoral college ceremony, so no winner could be determined. Of the three states, South Carolina's story is most memorable. There, Democrat gubernatorial candidate Wade Hampton, supported by his so-called red shirts, staged what amounted to a coup of Republican Governor Daniel Chamberlain. Hampton received about 18,000 more votes than there were white men registered in the state in 1876. It stretches credulity to believe that many blacks voted the Democrat ticket. It seems much more likely that voter fraud was the culprit. Despite the usual Republican declamations of injustice, as well as appeals to outgoing President Grant to do something, the writing was on the wall. Grant did actually do something, though. He sent more troops in, but it didn't change anything. It just prolonged the inevitable. In the end, Hampton managed to pull off a 50 to 49% squeaker. It was undoubtedly a fraudulent victory, but it was still a victory. In Louisiana, the gubernatorial election of 1876 had less drama, but a similar outcome, as the winner was not determined prior to the compromise of 1877. In Florida, there was even less drama than that, as the Republican governor in Florida was more realistic in his appraisal of the no-win situation that he was in. So he vacated his office in early January. Since the Electoral College could not determine the winners of the four states in question, the election was sent to Congress for adjudication. The law then, as now, gives the power to count electoral votes to the President of the Senate, which is usually the Vice President of the United States. In this case, Grant's Vice President, Henry Wilson, had died in office, and no replacement was made, so there was no Vice President. The ranking U.S. Senator, Republican Thomas Ferry of Michigan, was thus set to preside and count the votes whichever votes he chose. House Democrats objected loudly and belligerently to prevent that, of course, 
they claimed that there was a precedent that both chambers of Congress must agree on all votes cast. That was not actually technically true according to the law at that moment, although it had been true in the not too distant past. So the Republicans conceded the point, <clears throat> even though they didn't have to. The problem was that the Democrats controlled the House and the Republicans controlled the Senate. So it would be literally impossible for both chambers to agree on all votes cast. Thus, Congress was at an impasse. Since the U.S. Constitution did not specify what to do in a situation like this, the nation was in a constitutional crisis. As the days dragged on into January 1877, the leaders of the two parties finally agreed to create a special commission to determine the winner. The commission was to consist of 15 men, five from the House, five from the Senate, and five from the Supreme Court. It would also consist of seven Republicans and seven Democrats. The lone independent was supposed to be Supreme Court Justice David Davis of Illinois. In an ironic twist, however, before the commission was to meet, Davis got elected to the U.S. Senate by Illinois' Democrat-controlled legislature, and he recused himself from the commission. But there were no other mutually respected independents to choose from to replace him with. The least partisan of the remaining Supreme Court justices, Joseph Bradley, therefore got the spot. And that ultimately sealed Tilden's fate because Bradley ended up siding with the seven Republicans. At the end of the de deliberations in early February, the vote turned out eight to seven for Hayes on each state in question. The commission's vote did not end the controversy. It actually inflamed it temporarily. Most Democrat leaders were not willing to accept it. They threatened the filibuster of all filibusters, at the very least. Or they threatened to lead a violent revolution in the streets, at the worst. So as a last ditch effort to prevent both of those possibilities, some backroom negotiations had to take place between the two parties' leaders. These negotiations occurred mainly at the Wormley Hotel in Washington, D.C. After many hours of talks in a smoke-filled room, the two sides emerged with what came to be known as the Compromise of 1877. The agreement was that the Democrats would accept Hayes as president in exchange for three things. One, Hayes must withdraw all troops from the South and get the federal government out of the business of attempting to force racial equality on Southerners. Two, Hayes must appoint some Southerners and Democrats to his cabinet and to other high federal offices. And three, Hayes and Congress must fund more internal improvements in the South, as well as funding the construction of a transcontinental railroad running through the South. In making this deal, Republican leaders were naively trusting that the Redeemers would treat blacks fairly once they got those things. Looking back on it, what they had actually done was capitulate to domestic terrorism, expecting it to produce peace in the long run. Even though this agreement has been immortalized in history as the Compromise of 1877, at the time about four million Democrat voters called it the crime of 76. Their opinion was that just because their party leaders accepted it didn't mean they had to. Most never did. They considered Hayes an illegitimate president to the day they died, <clears throat> and that is understandable. Not only did this compromise result in one of the rare cases in which the Electoral College vote went opposite the popular vote, but it made Tilden the only losing candidate in American history to win more than 50% of the popular vote. He got about 51% but he still lost the election. Tilden himself, perhaps somewhat surprisingly by today's standards, 
graciously accepted the outcome and even quipped that he could now retire with the satisfaction of having won the presidency without the responsibility of having to do the job. Meanwhile, Hayes did have the responsibility of doing the job. He was sworn in publicly on the regular inauguration day of March the 4th. He said in his inaugural address that the compromise leading to his swearing in raised difficult and embarrassing questions and held deplorable complications and perplexities. If anything, that was an understatement considering the ramifications it would have on black Southerners. Hayes began ordering the withdrawal of troops from the South in April. Only then did Governor Daniel Chamberlain of South Carolina concede defeat and vacate his office. The way Hayes is typically presented in history textbooks leads students to assume the worst about him, that he was a compromiser with no principles. After all, basically, he sold out African Americans to gain the presidency, right? Was he not a Judas Iscariot or a Benedict Arnold? The answer is no, not really. He should not be judged too harshly for a couple of reasons. First, evidence suggests that Hayes was not directly involved in the negotiations that led to the compromise. He certainly knew what was being discussed and he tacitly, if not openly, approved of the terms of the agreement. But what else could he have done realistically? Even so, it didn't take long for him to feel remorse about it. And, you know, he saw the Redeemers redouble their efforts to suppress black civil rights almost immediately. Hayes would then spend much of the rest of his life after his four years as president trying to help figure out a solution to what people commonly called back then the Negro problem. Unfortunately for Hayes and the black population, that problem was doomed to get much worse and stay that way for many decades, thanks in part to this compromise of 1877. But the second reason Hayes should not be judged too harshly is that it is likely that the fate of the African Americans would have been just as bad, if not worse, under a Tilden administration. Hayes and his party leaders were actually trying to salvage what they could of the gains made for blacks during Reconstruction. Although Republican leaders didn't fully appreciate the extent of it at the time, many of them were finally beginning to realize that the majority of voters wanted to move on from this tired old Southern civil rights debate. The fact that Tilden garnered so many more popular votes than Hayes was proof of that. So whichever candidate became president in 1877, he would have been leading a nation whose majority was turning its attention to other issues. In terms of the impact this election has had on our system of government, you would think it would have led to immediate reform, but it didn't. Change came slowly and in small increments. Amazingly, it took 10 years before any meaningful legislation was passed to try to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. And even then, the Electoral Count Act of 1887 mainly just put the burden on the state governments to determine and certify their own electors. It removed Congress from any direct involvement in the process. It left Congress with only a ceremonial role of counting the Electoral College votes sent to it by the states and certifying and declaring the winner. Essentially, therefore, it just reinforced the Democrats' position on state sovereignty and hence dealt another blow to black Southerners. After the debacle of the 1876 election, Congress played no direct or dramatic role in deciding a presidential election again until 2021, 
except for a few cases when the losing side made obligatory objections. There was never any serious danger that Congress might override the Electoral College's certifications. 2021 changed that, of course, with the drama of outgoing President Trump's attempt to sway the outcome of the electoral vote count by holding a rally in Washington and encouraging the huge crowd of supporters to march on the Capitol while the count was taking place. Meanwhile, the damage that the Compromise of 1877 did to African Americans is told in the story of Jim Crow. And it serves as the sad background to the better known story of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. And that's a story best saved for another day. Mm -hmm.